Are we ready? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Good morning. Having a little bit of technical difficulties, but I think we figured it out. Um, thank you all for being with us here today. I see a lot of familiar faces, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Samantha Schock, and I'm the Director for Community Innovation and Evaluation at the Leonard Parker Pool Institute for Health within Lehigh Valley Health Network. I know there's a lot going on today, so thank you for taking time out of your schedules to be here with us this morning. At the Pool Institute for Health, we recognize that health happens where people live, in neighborhoods. Factors like socioeconomic status, education, and physical environment have more of an impact on health over time than the health care we receive. Therefore, to achieve significant improvements in health outcomes for local populations, we work to address those long-term drivers of health outside of health care. And most importantly, we know it will take each one of us and so many more working together to create the context in which health improvement can happen. As a part of that work, we think it's important to keep an eye on national leaders of health improvement and community development and learn what other cities are learning as they work towards similar outcomes. The Leonard Parker Pool Institute for Health Speaker Series will be one mechanism for us to import ideas to the Lehigh Valley. We intend to raise up practices and concepts that we think our colleagues will value. We are excited today to launch our speaker series with a colleague from, a colleague from the Ripple Foundation, Dr. Bobby Milstein. LVHN, the Pool Trust, and the Ripple Foundation have been working together for years, exploring ways to re-envision health and the systems that impact health. As the Pool Institute for Health was getting started, we enlisted the Ripple Foundation to do two important foundational things. First, conduct interviews with LVHN colleagues and leaders to learn about their perspective of the, the role the Institute can play in health improvement efforts. And second, conduct a landscape assessment to understand which health systems are thinking about problems that lie ahead of us in the same way. In February, Dr. Bobby Milstein and a number of other leaders published an article in Health Affairs about vital conditions, or the properties of places and institutions that all people need for health and well-being. As we thought about who the first speaker should be, Bobby and his work around thriving communities felt like the perfect way to start. Bobby directs system strategy for Rethink Health at Ripple. He's also a visiting scientist at the MIT Sloan School of Management. With an educational background that combines cultural anthropology, behavioral science, and system science, he concentrates on efforts that spark large-scale institutional and cultural change. Among many other roles, he is a member of the National Academy's Roundtable on Population Health Improvement, and a co-founder of Wellbeing in the Nation Network. Before joining the Ripple Foundation, Bobby spent 20 years planning and evaluating systems-oriented initiatives at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, where he was the principal architect of CDC's framework for program evaluation. Bobby, we welcome you to the Lehigh Valley and to Lehigh Valley Health Network, and look forward to your talk this morning. Thank you so much. <laughs> Apologies for starting late, but it is great to be among kindred spirits, and, and, and we're going to move fast because we have to move far. There's a lot of this work. As Sam said, there's a relationship here that goes back a ways. The work that you're doing here has a history to it, generations going back in some ways. And the whole point is to look ahead very far and think about where are we going together? What are the things that we can do together that um, are really the next chapter in the story of health and well-being in the country? Um, I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of what we'll do in this hour. Uh, we really want to cover three topics. One is, is personal to each of us as individuals working within institutions. The roles that we play have to be different than the roles we have been playing. And that's hard. It's, it's unfamiliar. Sometimes we're at the edge of the things that we've learned. Um, but to really get better results, we're going to have to end up adjusting our roles. And so we're going to talk a lot about roles, the evolving roles of hospitals, which has been uh, you know, sort of the story of what a hospital is in America. It used to be a place you go to die, right? They were houses of death. And they've morphed into community hospitals and homes of science. And, and now, in many ways, hospital is a big business. But there's more to the story than just being a big business. And so how do we think about the roles of hospitals in a wider movement, a movement oriented toward equitable health and well-being? Um, and we'll talk about what it means to be stewards, um, shared stewards in that movement. Uh, the second piece is even if we got the role part right, we're going to end up having to really get much clearer about the kind of priorities that are important to address. 
Um, as Sam said, we're going to talk about vital conditions, which isn't so much important what you call it, but they are the things that our lives depend on. Right? They're the things that make life worth living in some ways, and they're the things that we can't do without. When vital conditions are compromised, all of our potential for health and well-being become compromised. And so we'll talk about how focusing on vital conditions ends up bringing that social determinants agenda even more to the foreground. Um, and then lastly, the transition between these things. Right? We're going from a, a, a paradigm that has been kind of entrenched for a long time, and we want to open the way to something very different and something new. And just navigating that transition is going to be itself a topic that I think we'll at least cover and we'll end on today, because the goal is to be participating together and thinking and rethinking together as we go through a transition that, you know, toward something different. So that's kind of what's in store. We'll do it a little faster, um, but, but we want to make sure to cover all of these things. Um, I will say everything that we do at Ripple and Rethink Health is, is in dialogue with the kind of conversation that we're here to, to do today, right? We join with others to realize uh, what we think of as a unifying and a very measurable expectation of all people and places thriving together with no exceptions. Um, it's not just a goal, right? Th this is an expectation. We can actually create a world in which all people can thrive. Uh, it's just gonna take an immense amount of work to do that because we don't live in that world now. It's, it's not built for that at the moment. Um, it's not an issue of programs and projects. We're not gonna be able to do this with technical fixes or, or particular projects. This is, this is the work of, of thinking and acting differently every day in every way in all of the different ways in, in which we are positioned. Um, and that, uh, you said it, Sam, I mean, our, our health and well-being depends on a system. We may not even fully comprehend that system, but we can be much better stewards of it. And that system was never built for everyone to thrive, but we can transform it together in a movement of interdependent stewardship. So that's kind of what we do in, in um, engagements with colleagues all across the country. And so I'll share a little bit about what we're seeing in other places, but the real story is the attachment of you to the people and places here um, and, and this quest to thrive together. Right? We are unique people in a common world and the quest to thrive together is sort of a grand aspiration in some ways but it's also one of our best measures in all of social science. Turns out human beings are pretty good at measuring, at, at evaluating their own lives. Um, and Gallup measures this, this, um, this question about who's um, thriving and struggling and suffering. These are the data over the last decade. There are millions of surveys across, around the world and across the US. Um, thriving, this is just the fraction of US adults that, have been, that say they're thriving, took a took a deep dive in the Great Recession, uh, 2008, plummeted again in the, in the beginning months of COVID, has swung up and down as our fortunes of what this pandemic has meant and its compounding crises have gone up and down. Um, but just, and this is just the average of US adults. We've worked in populations that have done well-being surveys like this and, and the vast majority of people are struggling and suffering, very few are thriving. Um, but notice the y-axis. This, this number has never gone north of 60% in the US in, in history. Um, but it, it doesn't have to be that way, right? So the quest to thrive together, oops, sorry, one step back. Um, the goal really is to move this measure to a place that's never been. New heights of well-being, equity, resilience. Um, and that's going to take like a, a particular kind of work with particular kinds of relationships with each other. And so let's start there with a, a little quickie poll. If you join at pollev.com slash Rethink Health. Um, this is totally anonymous. You don't have to raise your hands. You don't have to say, but just think for yourself about how much do you really believe that Allentown um, can become a place where all people thrive together with no exceptions? Um, we'll take a look at this poll as it develops. Take a moment for this. pollev.com slash Rethink Health. about 30 people here, so we'll give this a few more moments. This is a study in small numbers, right? If you, look at, if you look at just the first few respondents, it doesn't always work out the same way. So we've got probably about 30, Five people in the room. We got 30 responses so far. Sort of get the gist of this poll. Uh, 
We asked this in lots of different rooms, and I've never seen it turn out really any differently than this. It's always a distribution. There's always some optimists among us who think, yes, we can do that. And our people are dedicated to that already in some ways. They've, that's the way they've always been working. And others are, are really skeptical about this can happen. Um, a word or two, anybody want to speak to the reasons for optimism? You don't have to here if you don't want to, but anybody who, who was on the higher end want to say a word or two about what you were thinking? Yeah, please. Yeah. Obviously, there's still a lot to do. Yeah. But um, you know, I've so far been happy with what I've seen. Thank you for sharing that. Right. The the source of optimism is that somebody is working on it. Right. That together we could do this. Hasn't happened. Maybe never happened yet. But that's not a reason to not try and to know that if we don't try, it's pretty much the surest way to make sure that we're not going to get there. So I, I really appreciate you sharing the the reason for the optimism is that we can actually attempt it. Um, Others who are thinking about the someone more skeptical view of this want to share a little bit about what you had in mind? Please, go ahead. Um, I, I agree with what she said. I'm more neutral. Uh huh. Okay. There are so many good people and good organizations doing good work in the city. However, the structural issues set up against residents in the city from a national standpoint. Yeah. So things that can't be, some things that can't be tackled on a ground level. Yeah. Or even a city government level. Yeah. Um, why I, I'm somewhat pessimistic. Exactly, right? This is bigger than Allentown in so many ways. And, and I will say that I'm one who aspires to this, but I'm, I can really identify with the reasons to think this may be incredibly hard and will it happen in our time uh, and a lot of it goes out of, it comes out of this fragmentation. We have so many players in a system that is really, you know, sort of divided into different boundaries and fragmented in ways where different people have different decision authority, different resources. Um, in the end of the day, personal prestige about what counts is like, how am I doing my job well? It's not built on that large movement. It's built on something much smaller. And, and so this can feel, this can end up feeling like, really paralyzing because we need so much interdependent action, right? It's, it's even harder inside of a healthcare institution. Uh, my colleague Stacy Chang has is, is, um, is got this lovely turn of phrase that healthcare is a planet that thinks of itself as the sun. And, and that, institute, that sort of view about the cosmos can really start to take hold about like, well, I don't know that we could do anything outside of the walls of what we know how to do, what we're equipped to do what we're charged and paid to do. And suddenly, things can feel really problematic. Like everybody in society is coming to us through our door because we've divested from so many other things. And, and every problem shows up as a health problem, mental health, physical health, um, you know, changing natures of what disease and affliction look like. And that could, that could really feel daunting. Like we cannot deal with all of society as healthcare. Um, and the, the, the revolution, the Copernican revolution here is to see that you're part of a bigger ecosystem. And that ecosystem is fragmented at the moment, but it doesn't always have to be. Um, this, overcoming this feeling of stuckness is hard because it feels like we have to have this interdependent action among so many players, but those players are disconnected, they're disenfranchised, sometimes hostile or competitive. And this piece of, of um, sort of skepticism is true of the whole country. We have an exhausted majority of Americans who don't feel like we could do anything really big anymore. We don't trust government. We don't trust you know, science. We don't necessarily trust each other. And that can lead to this feeling of, well, all I can do is what I can do tomorrow, which actually perpetuates a lot more fragmentation. Um, I'll say that the source of optimism that propels me to join Rethink Health and I think propels our team um, Eleanor Ostrom was one of the founders of Rethink Health. Uh, she won the Nobel Prize in economics back in 2009 for, for showing that, yes, when we think individualistically, when we think about this sort of illusion of separateness, everybody uh, you know, sort of takes and extracts what they think they need for their own well-being, for their own thriving, for their own survival. 
um, that is a pretty sure way to collapse common resources and it leads to this tragedy of the commons. That is a real phenomenon. It's happened throughout human history. Um, she won this prize for showing that it, it's not destiny. It doesn't always work out that way. There are communities and cultures that have found ways to not sort of extract to the point where they're collapsing the things they hold in common, but they're actually um, sort of caring for and cultivating and growing common resources over generations. And they don't do it usually through a state, like a strong state, and they don't do it through an unchecked market. They do it through really elaborate rules about how they're going to live together, a, a democracy that's thick with people's understanding that we're, we're going to have to live together and we're going to have to negotiate ways to do this. We're going to have to be stewards of a common world. Um, and that demonstration that it has happened, human societies would never have evolved if they didn't have this capability of being interdependent and, and in a very harsh and hostile world. Um, it just, it's just a little bit unclear exactly how do you get What's Allentown's path into that kind of future in a world that is so much feeling like we're fraught in this illusion of separateness and maybe even deepening that division? So it helps to have a word for this, right? This is not just conventional leadership. We think about leadership as leading on behalf of an issue or an institution, usually a position of you know, authority. Other people follow the leader. We're not talking about leadership here. We're talking about a word that we don't often even have a word for, but but it's most accurately thought of as stewardship. Um, that lots of people don't want to be leaders, they don't want to think of themselves as activists, um, they don't necessarily see themselves as entrepreneurs, but lots of people can feel like they can care for the things that are entrusted to them. Um, and that we can do this together. And so our definition of this is, it's a really sort of, in some ways, a very low threshold. Any person or organization or network, <laughs> right? We're here in a room of a, you call yourselves a network. Right? All you have to do is take responsibility for working with others to create the conditions that everyone needs to thrive together and begin with those who are struggling and suffering. The world was never built for everyone to thrive and the ones that have been struggling and suffering, they know best in many ways where the exclusion and the isolation and the, 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 the sort of marginalization happens. So if we concentrate on the quest to thrive together as an expectation and then stand in solidarity with those who are struggling and suffering, this can be the beginning of our stewardship, right? This can be the thing that animates it. Um, as I said, it's an old idea. It's an ancient word in some ways. Um, and, and if you look at sort of the patterns of stewardship over time, it's always about sort of extending what is healthy and humane, but also working with equal vigor to resist and remove what is toxic and cruel. Because um, we live in systems of both, right? We have systems that we know and we have knowledge and we have evidence that says, that says we can actually create health and well-being, um, and we're going to talk about the vital conditions that actually produce that, and we can also recognize what is doing harm and either resist its further expansion or remove that harm, alleviate it so that people's talents can flourish. Um, so here's a good question. Can we show this video? We have a little, I want to introduce you to a couple stewards right now, and we'll see if we can do this. Uh, yeah, so let's see. We're going to do a little technology switch. You guys feeling this so far, right? <laughs> Ready? It's hard work. This is not, it's probably not what your day job was asking you to think about this morning, but that's the beauty of it is we can think in different ways at different moments. And um, so, yeah, let's play this just few minute video. Um, yeah, just hit, hit this before. Well, Stewardship playing for me is about can I hear it? holding things. For, for the greater good, for the commons as a whole. It's not only about representing your particular interests, it's about saying what's needed in this process or in this community um, for everyone to thrive and being willing to both put your own assets in and create a space that's safe for everyone else to be able to contribute what they have uh, in a trustworthy way. I think what stewardship is, is not necessarily a model, it's not necessarily like a program, it's a way of being, it's a way of thinking, it's a way of making decisions, it's a way of casting culture, and I think that's really what stewardship means to me, is that we've all come to this focus on taking care of our community and being responsible for people who aren't necessarily linked to our organization. And that's not just going to be one small thing. It's going to be a, a series of decisions and behaviors that change for us.
I think one of the key characteristics of a good stewarding organization is being willing to be a partner, coming to the table with other entities. Our bigger systems tend to work in silos um, and try to solve every problem in our communities or fill every gap in our communities by doing it on our own, within our own walls of our own organization. But we were never able to do that. We weren't able to optimize the strengths of each of our organization, really stretch the money that we had available in our communities to really be able to provide much more extensive support where it was needed, when it was needed. Madison could be anyone in our community. Um, you know, Madison was born and raised in this area, um, and she was a hypothetical case that we utilized to sort of clinically walk through all of the potential gaps in our system. And we really realized that if we focused more on those vital conditions, we could really change um, outcomes for people in a really profound way and stop that unraveling that oftentimes can take years for people to, to, to recuperate from, if at all. Part of that shared stewardship journey is knowing, is keeping ourselves not just open, but seeking those who might hold other pieces of the puzzle. Um, and intentionally like recognizing that we exist in the context of systems of racism and uh, um, income inequality and other structural inequities, um, at some level prioritizing the inclusion of pieces of the puzzle that would historically be left out. The way we take care of patients is different, how we define health is different, and so I think it's important that stewardship is here as a roadmap, as a playbook, because everyone's eventually going to be moving forward and trying to take this on. When you lift the and change the systems that are holding many people back from contributing, it, it releases enormous, enormous abundance not just money, um, it, it does do that often, but often what it releases is what's possible. It releases countless assets um, that are, then become, create new possibilities of what a community could do. It's a journey of personal reflection and transformation. Okay, we could switch back to the other gig here. Um, sound familiar, right? You've met some people, you were speaking to some of these kind of players, right? They're, the amazing thing about stewardship is that it's, it's sort of unseen and uncelebrated, right? This is not something that gets the front pages. It's, it's, we really are um, used to telling stories about individual organizational leaders and, and those people who do their part very well but not those who actually do their parts in ways that invite other people and get more interdependent with each other to be able to do things that they haven't done before. And so I've been learning a little bit from, uh, from the reflections that you've been doing about what can happen in the next chapter of work here in Allentown. The very formation of the Pool Institute in some ways is a stewardship maneuver. It's a really significant unfinished story about a commitment to not do necessarily the same work the same way. Um, but that means change and even change for the better is hard. Um, so there's an unfinished story about stewardship here in the Pool Institute and with the Lehigh Valley Network uh, and with the other organizations that exist in this ecosystem. Remember, we can't think of healthcare as the sun around everything. It's the people in the place that are the centerpiece. And then the question is, what is happening with those people and even the new people that, that um, enter into this place over time. Um, Sam said that one of the really interesting things about this work, if you think about the challenge of doing it well in Allentown, is that there are counterparts in other places all over the country. They're sometimes really hard to find, um, but when, they, when you notice them or when you interact with them, there is this sense of kindred spirits. It's like, oh, I really didn't know there were too many other people working on it in their way, um, and I highlighted a few here just because, uh, let's say, in Jefferson, not, not too far, you saw a video there that was speaking to Jefferson um, Health in Philadelphia, who were learning how to sort of use the philanthropy that's connected to their hospital. Most hospital philanthropies are out there raising money to build more hospital. They're not there to build wider relationships with other players to be able to do things for the health and well-being of all the people 
in their population. So Jefferson's on a journey to do that in some ways in a big competitive market. Um, you got Methodist Health Ministries is really interesting covering huge sections of Texas that has built a financial model where the, the, the revenue that comes through their healthcare delivery is channeled into an enterprise of, of wide-scale community engagement. This is not a community health benefit you know, allocation within the hospital. They have a business model that is hardwired to a wider agenda. Um, in Inland Empire, the Inland Empire Health Plan is, is recently created, not unlike the Pool Institute, they've created an Inland Empire Health Plan Foundation, which is taking like $100 million, $80 million out of the health plan's assets to locate it in a foundation that's going to do something that's never been done before in Inland Empire. Um, and I'm going to tell a little bit more about Fox Cities because the big major player, not too different from, from LVHN here, is, has been hard at work trying to weave themselves into a wider network of players in Wisconsin. So there's this something about these Goldilocks markets where you're big, you're not the only ones, and there's other players, but your stake is involved to be able to be deeper stewards, right? Stewardship is easier when you're really committed, and we should start there, right? And it might be harder in big competitive markets, um, but we can tackle those market dynamics in other ways. What Allentown's story is is, in some ways, a fertile ground for being able to have institutional stewardship um, take hold. So a lot. This gets really, really hard if everybody is sort of talking about slightly different languages. If we're talking in euphemisms, some people are working upstream, others are working on downstream. My downstream might be your upstream, and it's just like it's pretty confusing to know exactly what's going on. We have social determinants of health. We also have social determinants of equity. They're not all social. There's economic, environmental determinants. There's political determinants, uh, 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 moral determinants now. It's a really confusing arena. And uh, I'm happy to say that in, in, out of the frustration of like, what are we really doing if we're supposed to be assuring conditions in which all people can be healthy and well, then what are those conditions? Uh, seven or eight years ago, our team at Rethink Health teamed up with lots of others to try to articulate what are these conditions that we should be assuring. And it's grown up into this framework you're seeing here. Um, you know, there's, there's no rocket science to this. We need a thriving natural world. We need basic needs for health and safety, clean air, clean water, nutritious food, um, freedom from addiction and trauma and violence, and routine health care, right, is, is, is a sort of ongoing vital condition. It goes into humane housing and meaningful work and wealth, lifelong learning, reliable transportation. At the center of it all is this, this sense of belonging and civic muscle. Uh, right? The we and how connected we are, how, who feels they belong, who feels that they have things to bring. Right? We have this deep human need to connect and to contribute. And that asset, in some ways, is what equips us to be able to do all this other work and to do so equitably. Um, so belonging to civic muscle is unique in that it is both a vital condition and a very practical capacity that determines the degree to which we can um, have equitable progress in all these other areas. Um, over the last several years, this has become pretty widely used, and there's a whole generation of change makers who are learning what it means to organize around these vital conditions in ways that don't put health or health care as the flag around which everybody is supposed to rally. Um, that can actually be inadvertently alienating a lot of allies who don't necessarily see health as their business, but we need all of these vital conditions, and none of us who have them would ever do without them. And so we really have to find ways of organizing. And so this is becoming increasingly widespread. I, I, I will say it's not just an, a, um, a kind of community level change maker thing. There are 44 federal agencies now who have been spending the last several years in the pandemic thinking about what they're going to do differently, um, and not just in each agency, but how they're going to work across the federal government. They too have found the virtues of organizing around vital conditions. And, um, and are orienting that around, like, how do we at institutional and governmental levels actually connect around the practical needs that people feel in their own lives? Um, that's a different thing. There was this paper that um, Sam referred to in Health Affairs recently. It ended with this quote that never before in American history have so many federal agencies and so many leaders across the country been organizing around the same set of vital conditions. Like, it's just never happened before. And so the stakes are really high for what can we do now that at least we have working agreements around these, these statements of value. These are widespread values. And the question is, who's going to help establish them? Um, 
The framework of our vital conditions also highlights uh, interesting contrast with urgent needs, right? It's not all about establishing these vital conditions. All of us end up in crisis. We might need help um, from professionals in many ways. That, that help is you know, acute care for illness or injury. It could, be, it could be mental or physical crisis, addiction treatment, crime response, unemployment um, assistant, environmental cleanup, uh, homeless services. These things are life-saving. They're life-altering. But there's no amount of urgent services that can produce the experience of thriving. That alleviates struggling and suffering but you really need the vital conditions to be able to thrive. So we have to be able to negotiate whole portfolios of change. And um, when, when people get together and start talking about both sides of this dynamic, it starts ending up being a discussion about the legacies because these, our sort of experience of health and well-being goes up and down through our lives. But the vital conditions are things we encounter on day one. We're going to pass them on to other, other generations. And so they raise these questions about, well, we encountered a world that's, that's sort of inheriting legacies of both justice and injustice, um, adversity and harm, and which of those do we continue and prosper? Which of those do we reckon with and replace? Um, and so we have these capacities through our belonging and civic muscle to be able to steer the course of change in a new direction. And that raises a pretty good question about what's your work in Allentown going to be seen as in the view of what kind of ancestors are you to future generations that are coming forward. I've found no other framework that gets to that conversation faster in a room of where people come with very different experience, very different perspectives, but we can, we can begin to have that discussion almost immediately when we, reckon, when, we, when we start thinking about both the vital conditions and the urgent services. It's a bridging framework, and it's a way of telling stories. Um, uh, so I've said enough about the move beyond. This is not like a replacement for social determinants. This is an extension of what that agenda has always been, just rendered in a form that's more sort of clear, concise, easily understood by people who are not necessarily health professionals. Um, and it's the medium of telling big stories, right? As I understand the pool's strategy, right? You, you could begin to build stories out of the building blocks of, of this portfolio and say, well, what is our play on cradle to career or to, or to, um, or to college? Or you know, what does community health and well-being really mean and look like? How is that tied to what we're doing in food and nutrition or safe and healthy housing? These are not like singular programs. They are, they are chapters in a story about the kind of stewardship that you're attempting to do. And no one player could ever tell that story. So there are going to be a lot of protagonists. Um, and they're going to be protagonists who figure out where are we starting from, and what are those legacies that we want to establish, no matter how hard or how long it takes to make it happen. Um, so I, this is like a little mini summary here. Um, I said at the top, this is not like programs and projects. A lot of the logic that dominates health and healthcare has been like, we want health and well-being, we want equity, but the truth is, we don't know how to do those things, so we design programs and projects that are meant to deliver very particular outcomes, and, and on good days, we deliver those outcomes. The trouble is that over time, the effects are like generally pretty weak, right? If there's an effect at all, it doesn't really last very long. So it can be weak or temporary when it gets to these big dynamics of who's thriving and, and who feels like they're included and, and who doesn't. Um, so if we're really interested in bending the arc of history, moving that thriving trend to a different direction, um, it can't really be done with programs and projects. It really is more like a North Star expectation. We're going to get to a place where all people are thriving. We have to design a system that's built for that, and that becomes the relentless orientation. Um, we do it through shared stewardship, which is marked by a number of practices and processes. Um, I won't take the time now to enumerate them, but this is a good thing to revisit. Like, How do we understand what good stewardship is? We all could do it better. Uh, and that's not the issue of interventions that are programs and projects. This is about routine mindsets and actions. What do we do every day to connect across difference, to expand opportunities that weren't there before, and to learn and adapt with all of the signal gathering and measurement that's needed to not just sort of chart progress from where we were, but actually be able to say, how close are we to the expectations that leave nobody out, that actually create these vital conditions where they haven't been before. So you guys feeling the gist of this? This is, at least on paper, a way to get more stronger and lasting effects. Um, 
so this isn't so much a story about like A will cause B. It's much more like without A, we're never going to get B, right? It's very hard to get to a place of more equitable health and well-being in a, in a system that is unstewarded. And for the reasons that you said, it's, it's too fragmented to believe that every little parallel play is going to add up to a better system. We're going to have to be better stewards of that system. And, and that's the question, is how effectively will we do it and how strong and how, how long will it last? Um, everybody feeling that? Right? So far, so good. Any like clarifying questions at the moment? I just want to spend a few minutes talking about the transitions going forward, but everybody feeling this? OK. Um, so I've already made the case that a fragmented system is really incapable of delivering the kinds of effects we're talking about. So one future is, is where the fragmentation that is the norm now, the way to read this graph is like looking ahead over time, um, or backward for that matter. Right now, the y-axis is what's, what's, what's common, right? What's normative practice? What's business as usual? Business as usual now is fragmented organizationally. It's deeply divided socially. There's an us and them narrative and that sense of healthcare as the center. But what else is going on is really far outside of our walls. And we don't really play in those spaces very much. That's what, or we try, but it's, it's a stretch. Uh, so that kind of arena is one way of looking at it. The other is to say, how do we cultivate interdependence? How do we recognize that, that, um, that we could build a whole ecosystem of players and really start investing in the infrastructure and the networking that allows those players to connect? Um, that's, a, that's a kind of a grand aspiration. It might take decades or more, lifetimes, to be able to see that become the norm. Um, but the truth is we could see pockets of this in the present, right? As I understand, you've got innovations even in your recent history, right? There's a street medicine program now that wasn't there before. There are relationships to education that weren't there before. There's a story about the park bench that I don't even fully understand, but it sounds super cool that, you know, like simple innovations that are capable of beginning to say, you know what, we can begin to work across those boundaries that have historically been the dividing lines, and they could be dividing by institution, or they could divide by color, or party, or, um, uh, or you know, sort of people's discipline and perspective. Uh, so maybe just take a moment or so. What are some of these pockets of innovation in the present that you see? You were speaking to a few of them, um, so we'll come back to you if you if others don't have thoughts. But what do you see as some of these pockets of innovation in the present that that might be somewhere on this trajectory toward? greater interdependence. Large or small, it doesn't matter. Just whatever you see might be pieces of this. Please. Um, I think just paying for nursing school. So students now in Allentown have to pay. Yeah. Yeah, career path that actually is local. It weaves people in. It's dignified. Great, love it. Others? What do you see? Please. Uh, I just think about a lot of the collective impact moves. And in particular, one of my colleagues uh, worked on trauma informed Yeah, I love it. The collective impact would not have become the darling of the field of the last decade if it didn't deliver some real effects. And it was a, it was a response to this fragmentation that if we could really rally around something, the collective um, sort of structure of that can speed up and accelerate the actions on things that have historically always, we've always known that we could do those things. We just never been organized to do them. Um, and they have this odd effect of there's a collective impact on education in some cities. They also have a collective impact on e economics and others. Like, they can proliferate collective impact tables on many different topics. So there's the sort of higher levels of organizing that happen. But it's a good example that the old way isn't the only way. And yeah, I love it. Uh, one other. What else is somebody else seeing? Please.
Yeah, love it. The, the, we don't have to criminalize every act that happens, and um, a caring response is often, often the better one. To, to act as criminal justice don't necessarily have to be the ones that come first. I love that. So these pockets of innovation are going to stay little bright spots, but it's really hard to kind of bright spot your way into a reliable system, right? And often these innovations, they don't necessarily take hold and become the norm. Um, and so that, that's the goal of really this middle bridging path, right? How do we be much more intentionally interdependent? How do we figure out ways to build structures of stared stewardship that um, are the basis on which we're adding even more? You don't have to do it all at once, you know, at full strength on day one, but building toward it can be the, the sort of rapid path than just hoping that pockets of innovation somehow are going to form and take hold and become a norm. Um, so it really becomes a question of what to let go of in order to get something even better, right? Every change is hard, especially when you're dealing with institute, like people embedded in institutions. Um, when we're dealing with like a larger uncertainty and we get the news every day, I mean, the news today was painful. The news every day is kind of painful. And if that doesn't get channeled, I mean, it could easily cause rage, which it does in me some days, and it causes apathy in other days. Most Americans, if you believe the polling, are quite frustrated and exhausted. They don't know how to help. Um, but if we can channel that into, yes, there are some things we're going to have to let go of in order to get something better. And to have a, we may not even know what those are necessarily, but we want to we have that discussion, willing to let go of something in order to get something better. Um, again, back to the story of the pool trust, right? You could have kept doing what you were always doing, funding the things that you were doing, and it was valuable research, but there are new questions and new possibilities, and so adjusting to that change involves loss. A new role for a new player is going to involve some losses, but the issue is what can we gain from that that we haven't really been able to be doing before. Um, I'll tell a little quick story from a community that we work in. in, in um, it's actually 19 municipalities in, in Wisconsin. Uh, they, they have an affinity for each other because a river runs through them. This was the epicenter of paper industry in the US, the largest paper mills in the country, maybe the world. And, um, and several years ago, they just got so frustrated with the understanding that some of the people here are thriving, many others are struggling and suffering, um, that paper industry had nearly collapsed. There's a whole changing demography in this region. Uh, new people moving there who don't necessarily feel like they belong. Young people who have lived there don't necessarily stay. 40% um, of the incoming class of kids in school are kids of color. This community is in many ways segregated, and people experience that segregation on a daily basis in all kinds of ways. And, and like a generation of civic leaders who had invested in infrastructure were older, and they were wondering what's going to happen to the next generation here. It's so much has been changing, and, and this is not unique to Wisconsin. This is a story of many places, I suspect, even Allentown. Um, and so they had lots of visioning sessions. They talked about a, a really galvanizing vision of the future that, you know, it, it brought up very clear pillars of their commitments to kids getting off to a strong start, an economy that works for all. Um, they, they have a really clear understanding of the spaces that people connect in, cultural spaces, environmental spaces. Um, and this, this quest to feel like everybody belongs, everybody can contribute. That wasn't even really good enough to get people into action, though. They really had to organize an agenda around stewardship, the practices of stewardship, right? And this was like 80-plus community dialogues, really listening to people and trying to make sense of what they were hearing together. Um, they started doing surveys, collecting a very different kind of data, not just relying on the, you know, uh, the, the sort of tallies of disease and body part summaries of, you know, what the burdens of disease look like. This was really asking neighbors, how are you doing? Who's, who's um, thriving? Who's struggling and suffering? Who feels they belong? Um, what are some of the challenges that we face here? And they organized living room conversations, big assemblies on race and racism, anti-racism. Um, and I'll, I'll say in a minute about how the healthcare system fits into that mosaic of action. But suffice it to say, they've been consciously innovating on what does stewardship look like in our region. 
Um, here are just some like little pictures, right? I mean, just imagine this is a picture of a room in a library, w windows where people come and make sense of what they were hearing from the dialogues, classifying those those comments uh, according to all of the vital conditions, tallying up who's thriving and struggling and suffering, um, and and now they've got data that tells you by race, ethnicity, uh, other identity groups, who really feels they belong. No surprise that the, um, that, uh, where are we here? Uh, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, so, do we have a laser? Yeah, so this is, this is uh, the average, right? Only a, a small group of older adults feel this really sense of belonging. Almost everybody, even whites, are, are, I mean, a scary thing, this is children in the region, do not feel that they belong. That's a scary thing for kids to feel like they don't belong in their own community. So it motivates action. Um, there's a, a group who've worked with our team, organized around this vital condition, well-being, um, the, the well-being portfolio. Theta Care is the big hospital system. It's kind of analogous to LVHN there. And they have participated with these other major funders, civic-minded companies, the philanthropies, in the region, multi-sector partnership tables, actually talking about what each of them are committed to investing in, and how does that then result in the net assets that are in play in our region. So nobody's expected to do it all. They're all expected to have a story about what they're investing in and how does it contribute or nudge the, the directional change that they want for the region. There was no forum to have that conversation because People typically think about, well, I've got my money and we're going to invest it this way and maybe tomorrow we'll change our priorities. But the other people in the sandbox, they don't necessarily know what your priorities are or what they should be. And, and having a discussion about, well, I would be delighted to do this if you would do that. There's no forum to have that negotiation historically. Anna is here in the audience from our team, has led these discussions in multiple cities about what happens when people start to say, you know what? Our piece of the funding, our piece of the assets, is only one part of the story, and where do we have a discussion about what could change if we don't just each doing our piece alone? The fact that a giant healthcare organization, I mean, it's giant relative to the Fox Cities, um, is in the middle of that, makes everybody else feel like, oh, we can trust this organization a little bit better. We know how they do business. We know what their constraints are, but we also know how we need them to show up, maybe to advocate for things that are not historically only biomedical agenda, right? They, they can advocate for things that are really in the well-being interest of the whole community. So you've heard plenty from me at the moment. I'm just going to end by saying the conversation here is about the headwinds and tailwinds. We're going to have to let go of some things to get something better. There is some, if you buy anything I've said today, some kind of navigation from the fragmented present that we've got to a much more interdependent future, it's going to have to give up this illusion of separateness and join in a rising movement of shared stewardship. Um, but there are huge headwinds and tailwinds. I don't know what the headwinds and tailwinds are here in Allentown, and I suspect each of you don't necessarily know what the others see. So that's, a, that's the work, you know, in some ways. I, this, is, this is a conversation that we hear again and again in cities across the country. And sometimes it's with every player except the hospital, right? Which is a kind of a problem, right? Because this is the arena where people are going to look for their health and their caring. And that hospital system is not even in the discussion so much. Uh, that's not the story here, right? You're convening this discussion in some ways. You're a part of it. You've already got a head start in having public you know, sort of action on this, but it's not necessarily government, and it's not necessarily uh, you know, a grassroots movement only. This is really about change in every organization to orient toward a shared, you know, a shared endeavor. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, we can have a, a little bit of d dialogue. I, I'll just sort of end with this last poll, since you're already logged in. Think about this as we end with just a, you know, a little bit of time for Q&A. Uh, how attractive is the idea of joining with other stewards in a movement to thrive together. Um, you're not signing on to it necessarily, but this is just a question about how attractive is that idea? And again, it's, it's cool to say that you have concerns.
can keep answering this as it goes, but the numbers are kind of stable here. So we got 15, 16. Um, overwhelming interest, at least joining. That's really all it takes, right? Joining is, is it. <laughs> Even one other relationship has exponentially more possibilities to it, and then, then figuring out the forums and the ways to act are really the issue. So we've got the appetite in this room, and that can lead to really a, a very different kind of action. So thank you all. We're going to have Q&A now for a little bit, and um, apologies for doing it all a little faster than usual. About five minutes for anyone that wants to ask yeah, a question. We could, we, could take the, we could take this off the screen for now. Or you want to switch to your, yeah, um, yeah go for that. There's a little post-session survey. Um, we're going to all take it very seriously, so there will be a QR code here in a second. Um, but yeah, what's on your mind? What are some of your actions? So for those that are feeling optimistic about that, what's moving you? Giving you to make people on the WebEx key. Yeah, there's some folks on, on yeah, And we should have some folks on the front end. Please, we'll go to you in a sec. I'm a little hesitant to share this because it might be uh, somewhat controversial, but um, years ago I was a part of um, like some housing research, if you will, on how to improve, you know, the housing situation in Allentown. Um, and you had mentioned something a little bit ago about the, I guess, current interest perhaps of the hospital to be engaged in, in some of this that we talked about at that time there was no interest from the hospital because um, they felt like it wasn't their role. And so um, I'm hoping from what I'm hearing today that the hospital is now seeing that they, they do have a role because housing is health. Um, and so in terms of this question, um, I think that you know, being a resident of the community like I've shared, I think it's uh, my duty to be a steward. Um, and to share those perspectives um, and insights as a community member on how I think um, different organizations and health systems can play a role um, in improving our health. Thank you. Thank you so much. One of the things I'm hearing in your story is when, when players get together to address any issue that matters to them, it's actually quite painful that other people who ought to be there aren't. Right? You, it, it speaks volumes where you stand and where you join. And so... The, the, the conspicuous gap of who's with us on an issue that matters. Um, it may not be like they're the solution. Sometimes people don't join out of fear. It's like, well, what if I join there? That one's going to look for something for me. People, it's fear that holds us back from even joining. And then it creates distrust. Or, and it's actually pretty self-defeating because now when people withhold their assets and their engagement, it actually deprives everybody from is to create spaces where people feel capable of joining, they're willing to belonging in civic muscle first, I guess I would say satisfaction is the status quo, and then a commitment to say it is the big we and our sets that can really give us breakthroughs. Um, so I, I really thank you for sharing. It's not easy, but... Thanks, Sam. Uh, so thank you for that presentation. It was excellent. I, I particularly loved your comment about being the ancestors that are remembered fondly by the future. I think that's a, quite a load to carry, but an important one. I guess my question is for both you and Sam and Ed, how, how do groups get started? We have a lot of great things that exist in our community, a lot going on with the United Way and Collective Impact, but how do we actually get going, we clearly have enthusiasm. What do you see as our next step? That's a, that's a great question. I'll do one line answer, but Sam, you should do. Uh, so a commitment to join, right? To, like recognize that this is a movement, and the only question is who's part of it, right? So it's not like you're trying to be the first mover. It's really about joining a long story. Um, so that's sort of job one. And then the next thing is to recognize that there are certain actions that have multiple benefits, right? They're, we think of them as multi-solvers. And and really identifying those actions, 
conscientiously that are going to advance multiple goals at once. They might be health, but it also might be um, economic development. It also might be youth engagement. It might be civic innovation. It doesn't really matter what everybody calls it, as long as the action delivers value for, like, material value for people who, who care about it. Spotting those multi-solvers is a really good way to act. And when, when those 44 federal agencies, one of the things they told me they were doing something that wasn't just a joke, was that they identified 12 multi-solvers that across the federal government that they felt were going to advance many of their agency agendas all at once. But we're orphaned in some ways because, you know, we don't necessarily take big public action, you know, based on every department's agreement for their own reasons. And so if we can move on multi-solvers, that would be my, my hope, that you start where the momentum is and really build around right multi -solvers. I'll just, I mean, add and sort of ask a question back to you in some ways. I think for the Pool Institute for Health, we've started this in one particular area within Allentown. And so around housing and education and neighborhood engagement. So having folks join those groups, I think, is one way. But there's, this is also happening across Lehigh Valley, right? That's just one sort of microcosm. The United Way and many others are leading lots of um, efforts to address all the different elements that need to start to shift. And so I think for all of us, it's how do we be part of that conversation? And what I'm learning the most is how do we be honest up front about what we can do and can't do? Um, and I think that often, because we don't have that trust or we don't have that um, ability to really outline those boundaries, it stops the conversation, right? Because we can't, we say yes to something that we know we can't actually follow through on or vice versa. Um, we say no and there's a possible way or path forward. So I think part of it is just recognizing our own role in that, which is that steward piece of what can I bring to the table when I am with people in other sectors and other systems and organizations? Um, and then how do I bring that back to the large organization, particularly for us that's in a very large organization with lots of moving pieces? So how have you seen that sort of operate in other places? I, I don't believe I need this. But, um, <laughs> the people well, they can't wear it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Bobby, I was thinking about uh, your, your comments and thinking about uh, a Peter Block uh -huh. about what is the story in this community tells itself? And what is that story costing this community? Yeah, oh, I love it. And I think that's a question that always comes up in this kind of instance. So for me, and, um, you know, how do we begin? Well, for some people in this room, today's day one. We just began. The other is, for folks who are, are a little of longer duration yeah. working in the community in Allentown, we can probably harken back to a half a dozen instances over the last 20 years where we've convened a group of folks to gather around a concerted item that we've worked on, and there's a history of that. Yeah. Somehow, the story we tell ourselves forgets about the history of when yes. we successfully worked together. That's right. And we tell the story about Ach. Yeah. You know, it's a, the PA Dutch of Ach. Ach you know. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, to a certain extent, we have to remind ourselves of the successes we've had, and also for those folks who are just getting on the ride, it's day one. We just began. Exactly. Yeah, I could have said it better. There, there is, um, we, we begin thinking about um, so much of the storytelling is about what is wrong, which are diagnosing the flaws in our system, um, than it is about uh, reinforcing a unifying narrative. Assets and aspirations are really the beginning of any, any really good narrative, any good story. And making cases that we can thrive together and how, that's the, the way to start that bridging differences, treating our differences as assets, and then channeling investments in a direction around these vital conditions as multi solvers. And ultimately, we didn't talk so much about it today, but the, the measurement and evaluation turns out to be a critical piece of the story. Because the signal gathering and the decision about if this is a movement and it's a directed movement, you know, toward driving together, we're supposed to use our limited capacities to their maximum. But we're going to have to measure differently. We're not just looking at incremental improvement from the past. We're really looking at relentless questioning about how close are we to the things we want. And the data systems that we have, as you well know, are not necessarily organized around those questions as much, but they can be especially if they're all built to answer questions that are coming up in, you know, what are we going to do together? So, I love that. Um. Beth, I'll give you last. Thank you so much um, for this talk. And I would just say um, my sector is higher ed. Um, and we are willing to be partners <laughs> with the hospital. Um, so, 
but my question is really, I guess it is uh, maybe a little bit of an academic question, but I'm thinking about um, with those vital conditions, have those of you who've been thinking about them for the last few years established sort of uh, measures of how do you know when you've hit the threshold, yeah. you know, in category one? Uh, I mean, I, I, that's probably oversimplifying, but I'm interested in that. Yeah, um, well, so the vital conditions are more than just a graphic and a slogan. There are components to each of them. Yeah. Like in education, there's K-12, to 12. there's early childhood, there's K-12, to 12, and then there's lifelong learning. Um, and so, so um, it's really about taking the data systems that we've already got and analyzing them as though they are signals about our grand sort of uh, enriched definition of what lifelong learning is as a vital condition. Um, and so you can interpret high school dropout rates or um, uh, let's just leave that one just for one metric. It's part of a different way of interpreting that same data. Um, and there are data systems now. Uh, you look at the um, community commons uh, and the data systems that they do and the underlying tools that they've built are, are really capable of using uh, nationwide data frameworks and organizing them around the vital conditions using um, sort of benchmarks at a state or national level mm -hmm. to be able to see where do we stack up relative to others. So we actually have data systems at our fingertips to be able to do that. And there are states, whole states, that have been um, beginning to use that in practice in particular communities. So yeah, this is a good conversation to follow up on. All right, thank you everyone for being here. Yeah. I want to say thank you to Ed Meehan, the Executive Director of the Institute for Health, as well as my whole team that's here running around, um, and the Ripple Foundation. We have Bobby, but also a team from the Ripple Foundation here as well. So, exactly, yeah. So, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Yeah, take the survey, please. It's really helpful. Thanks to the tech crew who made it happen at all. <laughs>